Good morning to everyone uh, here and also to those who are studying with us in our virtual space. Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. And thank you so much for joining us today. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning excited and thankful, God, to be here, that you put us here, God. You brought us here. And Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent to die on a cross and be resurrected so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be saved. And Lord, we join us up once again today, God, because we want to sit at your feet. We want to learn from you, God. And we just ask that you bless all of our church members, our pastor, uh, his family, and just the whole community at large. In your precious son, Jesus' name, amen. So we're currently in our fall quarter, and our study focus for this quarter has been God's law is love. And today, we begin our last monthly unit in the quarter. And throughout November, we're going to be studying from the books of Acts, Romans, and 1 Corinthians. The subject of our lesson today is freedom from expectations. And the scripture is Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. In our lesson today, we have three divisions, the conflict, the consideration, and then the clarification, confirmation, and conclusion. And what we're aiming for today as we study is to learn how leaders of the early church resolved a dispute about Gentile circumcision. And then we also want to understand that despite having this conflict, the leaders stayed faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we want to realize that God's plan of salvation is beyond any human expectation. I'd like to start us off this morning with a question for us to reflect on. Do I measure up to others' expectations of me? You know, it starts from the time we're born. Our parents expect us to behave a certain way. Our teachers and principals expect us to uh, live up to educational standards and goals. If we play a sport, there's certain expectations that go along with that. In relationships, there's expectations. If we're in a certain cultural group, people sometimes expect every person in a certain cultural group to feel the same way or behave the same way. Our employers expect a level of performance from us. If we sign a lease or take out a mortgage or finance a car, we're expected to pay the bill. And when we work, we're expected to pay taxes. If we live in a certain state or country, we're expected to abide by the laws within that state or country. And even countries have expectations of other countries to the point they go to war over it and it turns into global conflict. Just look at the the Russia-Ukraine war, and look at what's happening in Israel right now. And then at some point in life, we start to develop our own expectations of other people in our lives. But sometimes expectations can be good for us, and sometimes it can be too much, a lot, overwhelming. It can feel like a burden especially when we become upset or frustrated and sometimes even angry because we don't measure up to someone's expectation or if they don't measure up to ours. But we're going to see in this lesson today that when it comes to God, his love, his plan of salvation for us, it is free from expectations, 100% free. I believe we have a graphic for our expectations. It's free. It's free free. It's not about anything we've ever done or ever could or will do. It's not something we can earn or be good enough to reach and attain. 
we're simply not able to save ourselves. Because as it states in Romans 3, 23 and 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 states, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Today's lesson comes from the book of Acts. Acts gives us some history on the beginning of the early church and how it spread, including Jesus' actions through the Holy Spirit after he ascended back to heaven. And Acts also records the actions of Paul and Peter in continuing what Jesus had taught. Peter was one of the original 12 apostles. And Paul the apostle was born Saul, his parents were Pharisees, he became a religious terrorist who had a reputation for persecuting Christians and destroying the church. He would go from house to house, dragging off men and women and putting them in prison. But then his life got turned around when he met Jesus Christ on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus. Paul spent the rest of his life proclaiming the risen Christ Jesus as the Son of God, even went on missionary journeys and wrote many of the New Testament books. This book of Acts was written by Luke somewhere around A.D. 62. And Luke was a close friend of Paul's. Luke was a physician, and he was also a Gentile. And just before the events of our lesson, Paul and Barnabas had been called by the Holy Spirit to be sent out of the church in Antioch to spread the gospel. I believe we have a, a map to show you for that, where you can see Antioch. And then Barnabas was a Levite from the island of Cyprus, which is also there on the map. Acts 11.24 says he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Today, Antioch would be in Syria, and it's the city where believers were first called Christians. This was Paul's first missionary journey, and it took them throughout Asia Minor, which is scriptures, and preached the good news of Jesus' resurrection. They would present the gospel to the Jews first, but when they rejected it, they turned their focus to the Gentiles. Now, by the time our lesson scripture begins, Paul and Barnabas have returned to Antioch, and the Antioch church members are meeting together, and Paul and Barnabas are sharing all that God had done while they were on that first missionary journey, and how God had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And that brings us to today's lesson. I'll read the verses in our first division, The Conflict. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So certain men had come from Judea, which is in the southern part of Israel, which was also on that map we saw. And they had come to Antioch in Syria, where Paul and Barnabas were ministering after coming back from that first missionary journey. And the message of these visitors was clear. Male Gentiles must be circumcised to be saved. Circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin of a male. God gave Abraham the right of circumcision as the sign of the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham to include blessing him and blessing all people on earth through him. All males in Abraham's line were to be circumcised. These men from Judea were basically saying that Gentiles could be converted to Christ, 
but first they had to become Jews. In other words, observe the rituals and Mosaic law that God gave to the Jews. Said another way, do what God had required of the Jews in the Old Testament before Christ came. And that included being circumcised because circumcision was the sign of obedience to the law of Moses. These men were what was called Judaizers because they taught a false gospel of legalism that a combination of grace and human effort were required to be saved. And we don't know who these certain men were, but they paid a visit to the brethren in Antioch. And we do know that the church leaders in Judea had not consented to their visit. Because Acts 15 and 24 says, we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. In verse 2, Paul and Barnabas had debate and disagreement within Judaizers. And when, we can really understand why, because Paul and Barnabas had seen God's power poured out onto the Gentiles. And whenever Paul and Barnabas had shared the gospel with the Gentiles on that first missionary journey, they made it clear that Gentiles could come to Christ apart from the Mosaic law because salvation was to be found by grace through faith in Christ alone. And what these men who came down from Judea were teaching was contradicting everything Paul and Barnabas had been teaching. And the issue being dealt with was not one of whether the Gentiles could be converted to Christ. The church had already celebrated God's work in the Gentiles. The Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Zechariah had even spoke of it. And Acts 11, 18, like four chapters back from our lesson even says, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Instead, the issue was the means or the method by which these Gentiles should enter the community of God's people. But it still had an impact on the saving part because the Judaizers were saying if a Gentile didn't get circumcised, then that Gentile wouldn't be saved. And it was a very serious issue that cut to the core of Christianity and needed to be resolved or else it could cause further division and have a negative impact on the whole future of the Christian church. This was not an issue that they could just agree to disagree on. So how should the Gentiles be incorporated into the people of God? That was the question, circumcision or not? abide by Mosaic law or not? The Antioch church members decided to send Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them up to Jerusalem to have the matter settled by the apostles and the elders. In verse three, the Antioch group made their way south to Jerusalem and it was about 330 miles and it would have taken at least two weeks on foot. And as they went, they visited the Christians in Samaria. That was on the map we saw earlier, and also Phoenicia. They would have relied on them for hospitality. And they also would tell them about the conversion of the Gentiles. And those brethren in Samaria and Phoenicia were filled with joy about it. Just as a question for reflection, will you tell your experience of God's work in your life to encourage other believers. Who will you tell in the coming days or the coming weeks? That was our first division, the conflict. And we saw that members of the church in Antioch of Syria were faced with a conflicting message from certain brethren that Gentiles had to be circumcised and observe the law of Moses to be saved. So Paul and Barnabas were sent to Jerusalem to get the conflict settled. 
I'll read the verses in our second division, the consideration, verses four through six. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believe, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. So the group from Antioch was well received by the Jerusalem church. And Paul and Barnabas reported on all that God had been doing uh, through them. On the conversion of both Jews and Gentiles during their journey. And how Jesus' command in Acts 1 and 8 was being fulfilled. That his disciples were to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. But some of the Pharisees rose up. So here we have some that are in Jerusalem saying the same thing that the ones who came to Antioch had said, that it's necessary to circumcise them and they must keep the law of Moses, meaning the Gentiles. The Pharisees were all about careful obedience to the 600 plus commands and rituals in the law of Moses and the traditions that they had attempted to even add to that. They believed that one could be justified before God by keeping the law. But in Mark 7 and 7, Jesus said about the Pharisees, they worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Philippians 3 and 5 says, Paul himself had previously been a Pharisee. Verse 5 says, these Pharisees believed meaning they accepted Jesus as the Messiah of Israel, but they still apparently also believed it was necessary to keep the law of Moses, including circumcision, even though it was impossible to perfectly keep the law anyway. Basically, their teaching was, Gentiles are free to come to Jesus. We welcome them. We want them to come to Jesus. But there's an expectation. They have to come through the law of Moses first to come to Jesus. But in Galatians 2 and 21, Paul said, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Hebrews 10 and 1 says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. The law can't save. It can only show us our sin, and as a result, show us that we need a savior, and that savior is Jesus Christ. So the apostles and the elders came together to decide on this question of whether the Gentiles should be required to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. In other words, are Christians made right with God by faith alone? Really? Or is it by a combination of faith and obedience to the law of Moses? Is the work of Jesus by itself enough to save the one who trusts in Jesus? Or must we add our work to Jesus' work to be made right with God? <clears throat> this meeting they held sometimes was called the Jerusalem Council. It took place around AD 51, about 51 years after Jesus had ascended back to heaven. And that was our second division, the consideration. And we saw that once Paul and Barnabas arrived in Jerusalem, the apostles and the elders met to consider this conflicting matter of whether Gentiles should have to be circumcised or obey the law of Moses. Our last division is the clarification 
confirmation and conclusion. It's verses 7 through 11. I'll read them for us. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But, ye be, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Peter is present at this Jerusalem council. Now, back in Acts chapter 10, God had showed Peter a vision of heaven opening and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. There were all kinds of four-footed animals, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice told Peter, get up, kill, and eat. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. It happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Now the law of Moses stated that some of these animals in the vision God gave to Peter were clean, meaning they were fit for worship or sacrifice to God. And then some of the animals were unclean, meaning they could not be used for sacrifices. Certain foods were unclean for Jews and forbidden for them to eat. But because of this vision, Peter understood from God that the animals in his vision were symbolic of the Gentiles and that God's gospel his plan of salvation was for the Gentiles just as well as for the Jews. Peter said in verses 34 and 35, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And then Peter preached the gospel to everybody that was gathered in the house of a Gentile named Cornelius, who was a Roman military officer. Verses 44 through 48 said, while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter and the Jews who were with him had just witnessed something new that God was doing. So here we are now in this lesson, a few chapters later at this meeting of the Jerusalem Council, and verse 7 says, when there had been much debate and commentary, Peter rose up to speak. Peter started by reminding everyone there of what God had already done in fully receiving the Gentiles without them being circumcised. Peter said, God, who knows the hearts, had already acknowledged the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, meaning the Jews. Peter was saying, if God received the Gentiles without circumcision, and he made no difference between them and the Jews, and he purified their hearts by faith, then the church should too. If the Gentiles were purified by faith, dealt with, by neither we nor our ancestors who came before us were able to bear. In other words, since we nor those who came before us are able to meet the standard of the law, and since the law doesn't save us anyway, why would we ever return to it as a measure of whether one could be saved? To go back to the law is to offend God. 
It's to stumble over the salvation that he has provided in his son Jesus and the sacrificing of Jesus' life on the cross and his resurrection. What a slap in God's face. And that's why Peter asked, why do you test God? Back in the book of Matthew, it was Peter who boasted that he would never forsake the Lord, even if everyone else did, yet he turned right around and denied three times that he even knew the Lord. But this time, God had opened Peter's spirit to God's plan for the Gentiles, and Peter couldn't help but to speak up and speak out and tell it all. Has God ever given you a message and then added the other puzzle pieces later and they fit together so perfectly that it made you know that was God? Nobody could have made those pieces come together like that but God. And then the next thing you knew, he had caused a situation or a connection where you found yourself sharing what God had done in your life making the mistake of focusing on rituals and traditions and history to the exclusion of his story, God's story, God's plan of salvation, the new thing that God was doing, God's revelation, his revealed truth in the Messiah, his son. And the Pharisees were not at all self-aware the New Living Translation of Romans 8 and 7 says, For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. If only the Pharisees would have been willing to acknowledge Israel's failure after failure under the law, everything from worshiping a golden calf to not remembering the Sabbath, not to mention each of the Pharisees' own individual failures, then maybe they would have realized that their own actions didn't even measure up to the standard of the law of Moses, and maybe they would not have been so quick to expect the Gentiles to be circumcised and be put under the law. In other words, the Pharisees themselves were not practicing what they preached. But as someone once said, you can't change what you won't acknowledge. In verse 11, Peter said, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. It is through grace that all are made right and saved, both Jew and Gentile, and not by obedience to the law. Jewish Christians were not saved by their attempts to keep the law, not even a little bit. They were made right for Jesus Christ. Paul said in Acts 13, 38 to 39, Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. When Christ came, he set us free from the yoke of bondage of the hundreds of commands in the Old Testament law. He met those demands, and he fulfilled the law in every way. He did that for us. Now we're under a new covenant, not a covenant of rules and ceremonies and animal sacrifices, but a covenant of faith in Jesus Christ. Now we serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living by the Spirit. And that's why the Jews in Paul's day needed to shift their thinking and their words and their actions from trying to satisfy the law to a life led by the Holy Spirit. God's will is now fulfilled in our lives through the inner influence of the Holy Spirit instead of the outer influence of the law of Moses. Paul said in Galatians 5 and 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We now have freedom in Christ, and we can live in his way and love others by the power of his spirit. 
Old Testament law. We, just church, are under the law of grace, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself, as it says in Matthew 22. And it's not to say that the Old Testament is meaningless or irrelevant. For one thing, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And then many of the commands in the Old Testament law fall into the categories of loving God and loving your neighbor. And then it was the Old Testament law that showed us our sin and pointed us to Jesus. That was our third division, the clarification, confirmation, and conclusion. And we saw Peter clarify the conflict, confirm that God had already planned and worked out this matter, and conclude that there was no need, no reason to require the Gentiles to be circumcised or obey the law of Moses because Jews and Gentiles are both saved the same way through the grace of Jesus, not by attempting to keep the law. Now in the verses that follow our lesson, James, who was Jesus' half-brother and the author of the book of James, he was at this point the chairman of the Jerusalem Council. And he decided that Peter, Barnabas, and Paul were correct and the Pharisees were wrong. James based his decision on God's word in Amos chapter 9 when it says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. The apostles and elders in the rest of the Jerusalem church sent a letter and two of their own church members back to the Antioch church along with Paul and Barnabas and the others. And the letter stated, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And with that, the matter was settled for all time. So how can we apply this lesson to our daily lives? All of this about the law and the Jews, how can we apply this to our lives? I believe we have a slide to show for that. One, we can believe by faith in Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Faith, and then we can watch out for false teachers like the brethren who came down from Judea in this lesson. Let's discern the spirit by the spirit to know whether a word or a wind is from God. We can't allow man-made traditions to blind us to the truth revealed by God. And then let's resolve conflict in love as we seek God's word on that matter, the way Paul, Barnabas, the Antioch believers, James, and the Jerusalem church did. We saw in this lesson the importance of resolving conflict, not avoiding it. The leaders of the first century church, they didn't dodge that conflict about Gentile circumcision. And then the leaders stayed faithful to the gospel. We're saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, not through our family line, not through our accolades. The resolution of this conflict set a very important precedent for the future of Christianity. Circumcision of the body is just an outward sign that doesn't necessarily indicate anything, much less a change of heart. God wants our hearts to be circumcised and bent towards him. 
And let's continue to focus on God's business the way Paul and Barnabas did. They obeyed God all up and through the conflict. On the way to the resolution, they were still telling people about all that God had done on their missionary journey. They were excited about it. And it takes a heart of humility to focus on glorifying God and not trying to get attention for ourselves and our own agendas when he does something big in our lives. We must remember it's not about us. It's about Jesus. He did it, and he did it all. And then we can remember that the conversion of the Gentiles shows God's faithfulness in keeping his promise to Abraham to bless all families of the earth through him. We can be encouraged that God always keeps his promises, every single one. And then let's follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, the way Paul and Barnabas and the Antioch church and the leaders in Jerusalem did. Let's yield and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And then we want to encourage other believers by sharing our testimonies, the way Paul and Barnabas did on their missionary journeys and also on their way to Jerusalem when they stopped off in Phoenicia and Samaria. And when we hear about others' testimonies, may we be filled with joy like the believers there were. And then we can serve the one body of Christ and not play favorites and cliques. We can let love be our motivator and our mission. And let's resist the temptation to try to add requirements to God's free gift of salvation, to put expectations on others to be like us the way the Pharisees did. Let's try to be more self-aware that we don't always get it right any more than anybody else. And let's be willing to admit the Pharisees in Jerusalem seem to have realized, let's rest in the easy yoke and the light burden that's offered by Jesus as it states in Matthew 11 and 30. The burden offered by, Je I'm sorry, the burden that Jesus offers us is lighter because he's already done all the work. He's already done all the saving work. He carried that burden of sin for us. His perfect obedience is applied to us through faith. And then his righteousness was exchanged for our sin at the cross. The life lived by faith is a much lighter yoke and a much easier burden to carry than the heavy yoke of self-righteousness. Though the Christian life is not easy, give God all the glory and sing his praises for setting us free from the world's expectations. For it is by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not of ourselves. It is the free gift of God, not by works, so that no person can boast. God's plan of salvation is free from human expectation. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you have done, and thank you that you've done it all. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on that cross and be raised so that we could be forgiven of our sins and we could be restored in relationship with you. God, help us to be more sensitive to your spirit. Help us to be sensitive because sometimes you're doing a new thing. And Lord, thank you for allowing the Gentiles to be included in your family which includes us. Lord, we just, we just love you, Lord. If we had a million tongues, we just could not thank you enough. In your precious son, Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture this morning, we come from the book of John, chapter 3, and it reads, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Only you can add to the 
It is with a great deal of pleasure that we welcome you here to Indian Creek on today. Without a doubt, the Word of God is our hope and it's a relevant answer to the living of these days. To all of you with us on today, those in the sanctuary in person, as well as those who are joining us virtually, our prayers that God will bless your heart as we worship today. We are a loving church that worships God and serves mankind. Come on, praise the Lord, Indian Creek. Come on, anybody excited about worship this morning? Come on, anybody holding on to his promise this morning? Come on, let's bless his name. Come on, put your hands together right there. Yeah, yeah. Pray that you hear me saying I'm being patient, hey, waiting to hear from you. Do what you said you do. Help me sing. I'm being patient, waiting. I hear you pray, saying, saying to hear, to hear from you. Do what you said. What you promise, promise me. Hey, what you promise me. Let's sing it again. I pray, I pray that you hear me. Say, say, I'll be patient, waiting to hear from you. Lord, do what you said you do. I pray that you, I pray that you hear me. What you promised me. Hey, what you promised me. God, we're holding on to 
tell you, it is so good to be here this morning in the Lord's house, amen, to stand before you and to proclaim God's word for our scripture. This morning, our scripture reading will come from Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And for those of you that are able, stand with me, please. Amen. It's a beautiful Sunday. And the scripture reads, Finally, brethren, pray for us and be glorified, even as it is with you, and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do things which we command you. Verse 5. And the Lord direct your hearts unto the love of God and into the patience waiting for Christ. Amen? God's word for God's people. Let us pray. Eternal God, our creator and maker. Lord, we come to you, Lord, with waking us this morning. Because sure, Lord, we were not able to wake ourselves. And so we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your long suffering toward us. We thank you, Lord, that you have been faithful, Lord, to us. For you promised us that if, if, if we believed on the name of Jesus, and so we have believed, oh God, you have saved. And so we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation again this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have never left us alone. Not only that, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we're always on your mind. We thank you, Lord, that you're always thinking about us. We thank you, Lord, that you always care for us. And so we're grateful for that this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have never left us alone. For you have promised, Lord, that in times of comfort, Lord, you would be with us always. And when we needed your comfort, you promised, Lord, that you would comfort us. We thank you for that. For, Lord, we have lost loved ones, and you have comforted us. And we thank you for that. For we thank you, Lord, you have seen us through dangers seen and dangers unseen. And so we are grateful for that. Lord, we are satisfied with all that you, that you have done for us. We pray, Lord, for our worship service today. Help us, Lord, to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Help us, Lord, to lift your name this morning. Help us, Lord, to lift you this morning. For you said if we lift the name of Jesus, that you would draw all men. So help us, Lord, to lift your name this morning. And, Lord, just help us, Lord, to worship you, Lord, and, and just to always be grateful, Lord, for what you have done for us. We're praying, Lord, for Pastor Rain this morning that continue to bless and continue, Lord, to keep him this morning. Praying for our associate minister this morning, that continue to bless and keep. We thank you, Lord, for this praise, for this choir this morning. That you continue to bless, oh Lord, and keep them. And we thank you, Lord, for the praises that will go up in song this morning. And then, Lord, we thank you, Lord, again, for all you do for us. And Lord, we say bless your name this morning. For, Lord, you are worthy, Lord, to be praised. You are worthy. Oh, Lord, to be praised. You are worthy this morning. Lord, to be praised. Lord, you are worthy this morning. Lord, to be praised. Lord, you have blessed us. You have blessed us. Lord, to see one more day. And Lord, we thank you for that. We also pray, Lord, for those who are sick among us. But we know, oh God, we know, Lord, you will take care of that. We know, Lord, that we live in a war-torn world. But we know, Lord, you will take care of that. We know, Lord, we'll take, you will take care of that. Because you have promised us. You have promised us. You have promised 
you have promised us. Lord, we believe that what your promises will, will come true. And we thank you, Lord, for always, ta again, taking care of us. And we are grateful this morning again for our being here. Just praying, Lord, you continue to keep us and continue to all to be all that we need. No, Lord, we love you this morning. Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. And so, Lord, we pray this prayer. We pray this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus, the one, Lord, who died for us. Lord, the one who shed blood for us. We thank you now. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus, the Lord, whose blood, Lord, has covered our sins. And so we thank you, Lord, for Jesus this morning. We thank you, Lord, that in him we have life and we have it more abundantly. We thank you, Lord, that we can always call on you in his name. You will always bless. So in the name of Jesus, we say amen. Amen. We say amen. Lord, we say bless your name again this morning. Lord, you have been good to us. And we thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that when we were not good to ourselves, Lord, you were good to us. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord, when we were not on your mind. Lord, we thank you always. We thank you, Lord, your all mind is always on us. And we are grateful this morning. Again, amen. And bless the name of Jesus. God, for our presence in the sanctuary. And we won't, don't want to take it for granted that God has allowed us to come into this place one more time and for the express purpose of worshiping Him. And so on this day, we give Him our best, we give Him honor, we give Him praise. Amen and amen. At this time, it is time for our giving. And as always, we thank God for this opportunity that is ours to give. Because we understand that giving is biblical when we give our tithes and offerings to Him. Uh, God has demanded it in His Word. And when we give God what is His, one thing we know it is God would be faithful to us. And so we look forward as we tithe, as we give our offering, we look for blessings from Him. We give through Givelify, and we thank God for those who continue to give in this manner. But you can also mail your tithes and offering to the address at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be sure to receive it. Amen.
And now, Indian Creeks news you can use. Our regularly scheduled Bible study on Wednesday will have the following events to occur on these dates. November 8th and 15th, regular Bible study. Our holiday intercession will be observed November 20th through January 3rd, 2024. Second annual diaper derby. Save the date, October 26th through November 10th. Clean diapers get parents back to work. Start collecting diapers of all sizes and wipes. We'll store in the fellowship hall. More to follow. The Breath of Life 2023 Baptist Women's World Day of Prayer is a global prayer movement that will take place tomorrow, Monday, November 6th at 6.30 p.m. at Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church, 759 Pine Grove Road in Harvest. All ladies are invited to attend this annual event. Save the date, Christmas program, Sunday, December 10th, 2023 at 10 a.m. This year's theme is the redemptive birth of Christ, a gift of hope, unity, and salvation. The scripture is Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5. If you desire a speech or other participation, send an email to icchristmasprogram at gmail.com. We would like to have all parts and recitations distributed today. If you have any questions, please contact Tawanda or Troy Carter or Chandra or Aaron Holmes. Intercession services are available for students K through the 8th grade, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. Thanksgiving intercession, November 20th through the 22nd, 2023. Register by Wednesday, November 15th. Winter break, December 18th through the 22nd and December 27th through the 29th. Register by Wednesday, December 13th. For more information, contact the Enrichment Center at 256-837-1870. The Tri-State's Primitive Baptist Convention, consisting of Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi, will be held in Huntsville, Alabama on November 19th through 22nd. This year's host is Indian Creek PB Church. The convention headquarters is the Embassy Suites. On Sunday night, the William T. Gladys Educational Banquet will be held at Indian Creek at 6 p.m. The guest speaker is Dr. Clarence Sutton, Jr., Huntsville City School Superintendent. Donation for the banquet is $30 per person. Please see the bulletin for further announcements. Join us next Sunday for either in-person or virtual worship. A link will be emailed to you on Wednesday, and the link will also be posted on our Facebook page. Worship will begin at 10 a.m. That concludes the announcements. As a reminder, please submit your church announcements by noon each Wednesday. Amen. As always, we thank God for the announcements in our hearing, and we are sure that you're going to adhere to all of them. Uh, certainly in the bulletin, we have extra details, and for those who want extra details on these events, you can see uh, the bulletin as well. Amen. This is a special Sunday on today. This is Military Sunday, and today we celebrate those in armed service those are serving and those who are retired. And we're going to ask now that our committee would come forward. give honor to God for this day and for thanking him for another day, a day we've never seen before and a day we'll never see again. So we thank him for this day. And I'd also like to thank our pastor, Pastor Rainey, for giving the military ministry this opportunity uh, to present these uh, events in the body of Christ. Uh, it means a lot to us. And so uh, we just want to say thank you, Pastor Rainey, for always allowing us to do this. Uh, today is a, is a special day as we're honoring uh, a man, a valiant soldier, a hero, a father, a son, and a husband. And that man's name is Staff Sergeant Raymond Garth. He's the father of our very own brother Ray Garth and his lovely wife, Frida Garth. I'll read his uh, bio. Staff Sergeant Raymond Garth was born November 13, 1944, in Tanner, Alabama. He was born to George and Ella Lee Garth. 
A few years later, the family relocated to Huntsville. In May of 1962, when uh, Staff Sergeant Raymond Garth turned 18, he married his sweetheart, Cossie. Raymond Garth at the time joined the United States Army where he quickly earned the rank of Staff Sergeant. He was attached to Bravo Company, 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry, 4th Infantry Division as an infantryman and served in the Vietnam War. This is a significant date because on 13 November, on Staff Sergeant Garth's 23rd birthday, he was declared dead while missing after the helicopter in which he was a passenger in was taken down and lost due to hostile fire. The helicopter went down in Quang Tien, province of South Vietnam, known as today as Quang Nam. Mrs. Garth was a young widow at the tender age of 20, leaving Brother Ray and his sister behind at the age of two and one years old. Staff Sergeant Ray, line E, line 89 of the Vietnam uh, Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. There's a picture of Brother Ray with his grandson um, showing the uh, line where his father's name is. Staff Sergeant Raymond Garth received the following commendations for his service. He received the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, the Combat Infantryman Badge, Marksmanship Badge, the National Defense Service Medal, the Vietnam Com Campaign Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal, the Army Presidential Unit Citation, the Vietnam Gallantry Cross, and the Army Good Conduct Medal. Staff Sergeant Garve served honorably over four years. At this time, Brother Ray, will you join us here at the podium? We'd like to present you with a small token uh, displaying your father's legacy, his honor with his awards and decorations. like to say is, Brother Ray, thank you for giving us the opportunity <clears throat> just to recognize your father. Didn't know him, but it brings tears to my eyes thinking of the selfless service that he gave to make it possible for people like me, Sister Cynthia, Deacon Tim, and Sister Kelly, and uh, Mother Hattie's uh, Brother Burris, and all of the military uh, members that are here with us today. That means a lot. He paved the way for all of us so that we too could uh, serve our nation. And he gave, you know, the song says some gave all, and uh, some gave and some gave all, your father gave all. And for that, you know, we thank you for allowing us to recognize him. So God bless you. And thank you, Sister Frida. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Of our own uh, sister Dorothy Cross. Everyone, uh, some people call her Mother Dorothy. I call her T1. I'm T2. T stands for trouble. But Sister Dorothy served honorably during the Vietnam War. She was in South Korea at the time in a support role in which she served from June 1974 to July 1976. So Sister Dorothy, we ask you to come up to the podium, please, ma'am. Sister Kelly will present you with an case flag and uh, has a placard that says to Sister Dorothy Cross for your honorable service in support of the Vietnam War, June 74 to July 76, we love you, the Indian Creek Primitive Baptist Church Military Ministry. In addition, Deacon Tim Armstrong will present her with a bouquet of flowers. You want to say anything? Anything you want to say? Okay. And again, we thank Sister Dorothy for her service 
And again, Sister Dorothy, had it not been for women like you, uh, you, you broke the glass ceiling so that we too could serve. So thank you for your service. So to all of the veterans here today, we thank you. Whatever role you played, whether you were in the service, whether you were a spouse or children on the home front, you too played a significant part, and we thank you all for your service. Again, we thank Pastor Rainey for allowing the military ministry uh, to, act, to have these events. It, it means a lot. It, it, it keeps our tradition going, and, and we just want to thank him for that. So uh, don't forget, Saturday, November 11th is Veterans Day. Go out, get your freebies. Uh, there are some little trinkets in the back as you leave the sanctuary, so please grab one, and uh, just be blessed. And uh, we thank you all for your time. God bless. Amen. Won't you give our veterans uh, another hand of applause, our arm, all of those who are in armed service, all of those who have served in some capacity. We thank God for you, and we say thank you for your services. We thank God for our own brother Goth, his father, Sister Cross, and so glad to honor you on this day. Amen. Give them another hand. Amen. Amen. Now, in other announcements, let me mention, as you perhaps have noticed today, we have moved giving to the inside. They were the tables on the outside in the foyer, but now there are uh, two giving baskets on each side as you enter. It's just one basket on each side for our tithes, our offering, and our sacrificial giving. We can put them all in that same box. Amen. I wanted to take the time out to encourage all of our parents who have uh, children in our youth choir, we just want to encourage you uh, to get them to practice, to help them with their, their songs. Uh, it's important that they be here. And you know, when we look at all the other activities that our children in, are involved in, I think perhaps one of the most important ones is their activity at church, their activities for God. And so we want to encourage you to make sure that your children get here for practice for our youth choir so that we can have a full choir, amen, on the second Sundays. Amen. Will you do that? Amen and amen. Let me also mention on tomorrow night we have the Baptist Women's World Day of Prayer. It will be held at Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church on tomorrow at 6.30, and these are women impacting the world for Christ. Amen. The choir will again sing for us, and then we'll have the word of God. It's our tradition that we have prayer. And we want to take every opportunity that is ours to petition the throne of grace. Because one of the things that we realize is that we cannot make it alone. We need a helper. And that someone is our God. And if we trust him, if we hold to him, God will surely answer our prayers. And so whatever our needs are here today, whatever our hurts, whatever our heartaches, whatever our pains, whatever our frustration, there is a God who sits high and looks low and he knows all about us. And when we tell him about our issues, God is a listening. All of you who stand in need of prayer, we want you to assemble around the altar. We declare continuously that there is help in this house. There's hope in this house. There's healing in this place. There is nothing too small or nothing too large that we cannot bring before him. And as we pray today, and as the preacher prays aloud, you pray silently. God would touch every need that we have. 
Minister McQuarrie will pray for us now. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal Father, we come before you today, Father God, recognizing you for who you are, a sovereign God, an able God, a non-failing God, a trusting God. We come before you this morning, God, because as we go through this life, we're constantly dealing with circumstances and situations. Father God, we look to the hills from which cometh our help because we know, Father, our help come from you. Father God, as we go through this life, we deal with heartaches, pain, suffering, loneliness, bereavement. But Father God, in the midst of it all, you are with us. We pray, oh God, that every prayer that is prayed this morning will be heard, Father God. Father God, we know that you are able to do all things exceedingly and abundantly. Father God, we just pray right now for this congregation, this church, this community, Father God, for you know what we stand in need of. Father God, the long suffering, Father God, we just ask right now, God, that you will prop us up on our leaning sides. Hold us, God, in your arms. Give us the protection, Father God, that no other can give. Father God, your love, your kindness, your mercies. Father God, we thank you. For the illnesses, Father God, that are in bodies this morning. Father God, we just ask that you touch, Father God. Remove all hurt and pain, Father God. Cool the fevers, Father God, we pray. Father God, we ask that you go beside the sick beds, Father God, and give comfort to those who need comfort in God. Father God, for those broken hearts, Father God, for those who have lost loved ones, Father God, who are dealing with the absence of their loved ones, Father God, give them comfort this morning. Let them know, Father God, that you are ever present. Father God, that you will rock them, Father God, like no other can. And Father God, for any, Father God, any needs that your children have, Father God, we know that you can supply them. So we just count on you this morning, Father God, that it's done. And we want to thank you, Father God, for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that came down through those 42 generations, God, to save a wretch like me. We thank you, God, for goodness and mercies. And Father God, as we go back to our seats, Father God, we just ask that you be with us today and forevermore. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen.
let us pray. God, how we thank you now for this moment of preaching, this moment of listening, this moment of hearing, God, this moment of you speaking. Touch now our minds, our hearts. Open now the ears of the listeners. God, have your way in this place. We pray now in the strong and sufficient name of Jesus, in his name, amen and amen. <clears throat> Let me now call your attention to the book of Romans at the eighth chapter. The book of Romans at the eighth chapter, we are concerned with verses 35 through 39. Our principal focus is verse 37. But to read the verse in context, we want to read verses 35 through 39. <clears throat> Hear now the word of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it, as it is written, for thou sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now, our point, our point of departure is, is here in this 37th verse. Listen to it again. It says, nay, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, from those said verses, I want to talk about the assurance of victory. I want to talk about the assurance of victory. This 37th verse is called between a question and an answer. Verse 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verses 38 and 39 says, there is nothing that shall be able to separate us from his love. Here in the question, verse 35 names seven possibilities for separation. It lists for us tribulation, which is to be squeezed or to feel pressured. Distress, to be hemmed in by one circumstances. Persecution, suffering inflicted on us, famine, a lack of resources, nakedness, a lack of clothing, peril, the threat of imminent danger, sword, the threat of death. And after verse 35 name these possibility of separation, Verse 38 and 39 answers, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Our text verse, verse 37, here is caught between a question and an answer. Understand here, historically as we know in Paul's day, there were many things Christians faced. The early church was always on the fire, always being harassed and troubled, always pressured and persecuted. The Christian was always being rounded up and hauled to jail. And sometimes they feared that they had been abandoned by the Savior. 
And so Paul raises the question here today, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And verse 38 and 39 declares, nothing shall separate us. Our text verse, verse 37, is caught here between a question and answer. And this 37th verse assures us in spite of the accumulation of bruises and bumps in this life, we're going to make it. I thought about in the culture of African Americans, there's a well-known song uh, that has been a theme song of triumph during racial unrest. It has been our marching song in the face of bigotry and bias. It simply says, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Other verses say we are not afraid. It says we are not alone. This song is a rally cry that says we're going to make it. And that's what this verse is here today. It is a rally cry that we're going to make it. Listen to it again. Nay, in all of these things, whatever shall come against us, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul says what's happening around us and to us is powerless against us. The inevitability of victory in him is certain. And we should, we should ask, we should ask today, what is it that makes Paul speak here with unshakable confidence? Why is it that He's irreversibly persuaded. What makes Paul sure about our future? Our text verse here answers, here it is in the first place, the vested interest. You cannot speak of this verse here without considering God's involvement and investment in us. In all of these things, the text says, we are. You have to pay attention to that. In, in all of these things, we are. We, the people of God. We, the redeemed. We, the born again. We, the saints of God. And what Paul takes under consideration as the verse prior to our text says is that God has deposited too much in us to leave us alone. Look at what he's done. The 32nd verse in this same 8th chapter tells us this. He that spared not his son but delivered him up for us. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. To think that God thought enough of us when we were between no hope and no hope. He sent his son to die for us. He targeted us with his love. He commended his love toward us and died, paid the ultimate sacrifice, yielded to crucifixion, gave his life, died, and rose again. You do not make that kind of investment and not stand strong behind your vested interests. Here today, can you imagine us? Can you imagine us investing millions in some venture, millions in real estate, stocks, or some business opportunity, invest millions, and then just walk away. Absolutely not. There is a vested interest. We have a deep-seated involvement. This is what we're going to do. We're going to protect and preserve our investment. 
Now think about Jesus. His investment involved more than money. Jesus invested his life. Peter, Peter helps us here for as much as we know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. His precious blood. How much more is the Lord going to stand with us? How much more? He's invested his life. Beloved, we were bought with a price. We belong to God. That's why I'm able to say today, we have the assurance that the Lord has our future in mind. We are the church of Christ. We are the children of God. We are sons and daughters. But not only that, we are heirs. Read that 17th verse in the same 8th chapter. This it says we are not only heirs, but joint heirs with Christ. Jesus died and and rose again so that it would be so. What, what, what is it that shall be brought against his elect? What is it that shall interfere with what God has in store for us? He has deposited too much in us. I tell you here, you might face much in this life. You might feel sometime like things around you and with you are hopeless and helpless, but you're going to make it. I said, you're going to make it. And so here today, in spite of what we see, in spite of issues that pressure us, we are pressing forward with certainty because of the vested interest. Let me tell you what else here. This verse says, also, the triumphant expectation. And here, I like I like what this text says here. It says, we are more than conquerors. In spite of what the Christians were going through in biblical days, God goes on record through Paul and tells us we are more than conquerors. That's what gives us a sure footing. Watch it here. Paul says conquerors. In the Greek, it means to overcome and take control by military force. This, this, that's, that's good news today, but, but Paul takes it a step further, and he said more than conquerors. This Greek construction says to us that we are super victors. It speaks of overwhelming victory. But now watch how it plays out. Because we may think that, that, that all that, that is meant here is that we shall win abundantly. That we should win, win with room to, to spare. That we should win with resounding victory. But this verse speaks of more than that. It speaks of what we shall gain when we have gone through trials and tribulations. It speaks of the spiritual personhood, a better Christian, a better church member, a better servant. Here it is. True victory should develop the believer. You see, we are more than conquerors. When we come through hardness and hardship, more resolute to serve God, we are more than conquerors. When we come through strain and pain and we are more faithful to God, we are more than conquerors. When we go through and come through spiritually brighter and wiser, it's been said in adversity, we usually want God to do a removing job when he wants to do an improving job. When we come through our struggles, stronger in him, more than conquer us. Paul himself is an illustrator. The same Paul who was stoned at Lystra is the same Paul who got up from unconsciousness more determined to tell others about the law. The same Paul who was laughed out of Athens when he spoke of Jesus 
is the same Paul who later stood strong to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same Paul who was beaten and dragged to a Philippian jail is the same Paul who emerged from the jail with the heart to save the jailer more than conquerors. This is what the Bible says, and, and we know I don't care what you go through, and we know. I don't care what you're dealing with, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's what it says right here in this same text chapter. It does not matter what the world throws at us. It does not matter what the devil throws at us. We are stronger, greater, more, more because of him, more than conquerors. And so here today, we have confidence that in spite of what takes place in my life, the Bible says through much tribulation, we make it into the kingdom of God. And so it is known that we're going to have to deal with some stuff. We're going to have to endure some stuff. We're going to have to go through some stuff. But we have a bright future because of the vested interests, because of the triumphant expectation. Here's another thing. The empowerment given. This is how we're going to make it. Through him that loved us. Jesus' love for us enabled us to triumph. There was a senior saint whose pastor visited him in the hospital, leading him into devotion. He asked him the question, do you love Jesus? His face lit up with a smile. His countenance immediately perked. Grasp grasping both hands of the preacher, he said to him, I, got, I can tell you something better than that. He said, Jesus loves me. He loves us. That's what counts. His vested interests. He loves us. Nothing shall separate us from his love through him that loved us. Sometimes we think we make it through because of our own determination. Because of our own strength our own ability to troubleshoot. Sometimes we think we make it because of who we know. But let me tell you today through him that loved us. James Rowe has said, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else would do, love lifted me through him that loved us. That's how we make it. That's, that's where victory lies. For God so loved the world through him that love us. His love committed toward us, keeps us, helps us to make it all praise his name. And so I just want to assure you today, God's got us. I just want to assure you today, God's got us. I don't care what comes against you. I don't care what burden. I don't care what calamity. I don't care what danger, I don't care what folk, I don't care what fight, I don't care what storm, I don't care what hurt, I don't care what pain. God's got us. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors. Yes, that's our assurance. That's our breakthrough. That's our comfort. That's our celebration. The verse is victory. Yes. God's got us. God's got us. He promised never to leave us. Never to leave us. Never to leave us alone. God's got us. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches over me. God's got us. And so when we're done down here, yes. Yes, when trouble is gone, when this world shall end, he takes us up. No more suffering, no more sorrow, no more shame, no more pain, no more headaches, no more frustration, no more heartaches. Yes, the Lord, he has a 
us. He's got us through him that love us. I'm glad. I said I'm glad. He got us. He got us. He got us. That's why I keep running this race. Everything. Yes. Gonna be all right. Why should I feel this courage? Why should shadows come? I'm in courage. God's got us. God's got us. God's got us. Oh, bless his name. Oh, bless his name.
Amen. What a wonderful affirmation to the Word of God. God is a keeper. All to be kept by His power divine. Why don't you stand with me as we open the doors of the church for Christian discipleship. It may be one here today and you need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ in your life. The same Jesus who died on that cross one Friday, that same Jesus is available here today. And if you call on him, he sure the answer. We open the doors of the Church for Christian Disciples. If there's one here today, will you come? Amen. Amen. Oh, bless his name. For baptism by Christian experience to be restored under watch care, there's a savior in this world. And his name is Jesus. And if you don't know him, then you really don't have life. Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. You have to have Jesus to have life. And if you're here today and you need him, will you come? Will you come? There's still room. There's still room at the foot of the cross. And if you feel God nurturing and touching your heart, don't say no. Say yes to him today. Will you come? For those who are joining us virtually, there's a number at the bottom of your screen. And if you call that number, we'll be sure and get back with you on this day. But I wouldn't let the moment pass. I wouldn't let the day pass without giving my heart to him. Will you come? God bless you. We have Lamar Tummings, and he's coming for rededication and rebaptism. Amen. <laughs> Won't you come forward, Brother Tummings? Amen. Won't you give God another hand? God bless you on today. Are you coming from Madison Mission? Amen. All right. We thank God for your coming. And what we want to do, you want to be, you've been baptized once, and we want to be rebaptized and become a member of this church. Amen. 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 Brother Tommy, is there any word that you would like to have to say? Amen. Amen. We thank God for you. And we will baptize you on the first Sunday in November, in December. The first Sunday in December. And we thank God. What we believe here in Indian Creek, 
And then when God sends someone, he has a special gift that's in you, and we have gifts to give to you. And you have a place here because you have gifts that come from him. And we want you to feel free to use those gifts in this place, to give and to receive. We thank God for you. And we look forward to how this blessed union will come together strongly. Yes. Amen. Won't you give God a hand? Yes. How shall we receive Brother Tummy? In the spirit and the joy of the Lord. How shall we receive him? In the spirit and the joy of the Lord. With that, you become a member of Indian Creek after you would have been baptized on the first Sunday in December. We thank God for you. Amen. And we will give you the right hand of fellowship once you have been baptized. We're gonna ask someone from our new members ministry to come forward. Amen. Once he's baptized, who's walked with Brother Thomas beyond? Deacon King. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. They're gonna take you and give, give, give information to you and receive it from you. And we welcome you to Indian Creek. Amen. Give God a hand. Amen. Secretary, who do we have? We also have Brother Eugene Rice and Sister Teresa Tibbs coming for special prayer. All right, then, if you come forward at this time, we're going to ask Deacon Armstrong to get ready to pray for them as they come. Amen. Amen. Don't we believe in prayer and believe what God can do through prayer? Amen. Amen. Yes. And Father, we believe in your word. Father, you said you will meet each and every need right now, Father. Yes, sir. And we're believing in our hearts right now that you've met it already, Father. We're coming and agreeing, Father, that it is done in your name right now, Father. And we're praying that you just touch them right now, give them whatever they need, Father. Yes, sir. Through your spirit right now, we're going to lift you up right now because we believe in it's done. In the precious name of Jesus, we're praying. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you, sir. Amen. Amen. Won't you give God another hand? We certainly thank God for the word on today. And we thank God for how he has blessed us today. Amen. Amen. The assurance of victory. 